Well, it's another beautiful Sunday. Summer just keeps going, doesn't it? Except it's not as oppressive. It's wonderful. Well, I'm glad here to be with you guys here today. And we're back in the Word of God. We're back in the book of Luke. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Men, this coming weekend, Friday and Saturday, is going to be our retreat. And the crowd went wild. So, if you haven't paid or if you'd like to go, um, please, by all means, see Dino or see Carl. These guys will square you off and get you taken care of. Okay? The other thing is we also have uh, a potluck next week. We also have baptism next week. So we've got, we've got a full schedule for you guys. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll all be able to make it. So this week's passage is chapter 8 of the book of Luke. I titled it The Sower, the Seed, and the Soil because they all have S's. It was just... And you guys probably, how many of you are unfamiliar with this parable? Okay, good. So I'm just teaching one. I'll just talk to you then, Dan. It'll just be a private conversation. To just ignore the rest of them. It's fine. Jesus is speaking in parables and he begins to teach the people. And he begins here in verse 10. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest... It is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The next group of passages we're going to talk about, Jesus is going to stress how we hear, how we listen. How's your hearing, by the way? I have a couple of responses. That's good. So you heard me. That's good. That's hugely important. Because Jesus is going to talk about the way that we hear and how we hear, and it has everything to do with whether you're going to spend eternity with the Lord or whether you're not. And it's that kind of hearing with our hearts that's so important. And Jesus says, I'm speaking in parables in such a way that those who understand, understand, and those who don't understand, don't understand. The ones who understand, the kingdom's been revealed to them, and those who don't understand, don't have the kingdom revealed to them. And so it's, there's a lot of weight on this one particular parable that Jesus begins. And so before we talk about that, let's just pray. Father, you know our needs. You know that we need you. Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. And so, Lord, we need you now. I pray as we go through your word, uh, through a familiar passage to most of us, that you might bring new light you might bring new motivation and insight that we would see the kingdom of God and you might help us to receive it. Help us, Lord, we pray by your spirit because we know there's no other way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A couple of weeks ago, as we uh, were in chapter seven of Luke, we saw Jesus healing the servant of a centurion, and then we saw him raise a man from the dead. This widow who had an only son who died uh, was risen from the dead. And then last week, we saw John the Baptist in prison and sent messengers to Jesus and said, are you the one or should we be looking for somebody else? Because he'd been in prison for about 10 months and Jesus hadn't come and rescued him. And a lot like some of us wonder where God is in our most difficult times and in our hardships. And then we see Jesus invited to a Pharisee's house. And as he goes, this, this man Simon's house, uh, a woman comes in who has a very bad reputation around town. Um, she's, she's known for what she does as a profession. And she comes in and weeps on his feet and wipes them dry with her hair. She apparently wasn't prepared for this outpouring of emotion. And then she pours out this oil on his feet, um, which um, is a very intimate moment. And this Pharisee sees and says, if this guy was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman was touching him. And Jesus begins to tell him about the degree in which we understand that we're forgiven of our sins is the degree in which we love the Lord. So the question is, how big is your love for Jesus? 
certainly it's not in keeping always with what, how he's loved us and the degree in which he's sacrificed for us. But it's the ones who understand how much they've been forgiven who will love more. So the degree of whether you understand your salvation or not is measured by how deeply you love the Lord Jesus Christ. So now this week, we're going to talk about the sower, the seed, and the soil. And then it's going to lead into a couple of other things which seem completely unrelated, which we can do that. We watch commercials, right? And we, you know, you can, you can do completely unrelated. The funny thing is I thought they were until I began to read it and meditate on it, and the Lord showed me this unifying factor in all of it. And then I'll, maybe I'll share it with you. <laughs> Chapter 8, verse 1. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. So Jesus is back on the road again. He's got his disciples with him. And as he goes, he's talking about the kingdom of God. You'll, you'll notice it throughout scripture as you read. You'll see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and they're all somewhat synonymous. And you say, well, what is that? What is the kingdom of God? Well, most people think it's just about heaven, which is the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is anywhere where God is king. And where is God king? Everywhere. 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 Except in the human heart which we actually have a choice. Unlike vaccinations, we actually have a choice and God gives us freedom <laughs> to choose. And the crowd went wild. So Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God, which is about God being king in our lives. And it's also called the kingdom of Christ. So it's about the rule of Jesus Christ on earth, which can happen right this very moment in our hearts. It's also about the blessing advantages that flow from being under Christ's rule. It's about what it is to submit to the teaching and, and the leadership of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's the kingdom of God anywhere where Christ is seated on the throne and hopefully he's seated on the throne of our hearts, right? And it's also about us being subject to him. And so all of that encompasses what the kingdom is all about. So Jesus comes and he's teaching about the kingdom and that's his message. And as he goes around, he's going from town to town and he's traveling with his 12 disciples. I don't know if you've ever had to go camping, but man, what a laborious thing that is. <laughs> you got to gather all that stuff and you don't know what condition it's in because it's been stored for a while. And then you got to pack it and then you have to get everything together and hope you don't forget things like, oh, my charger for my phone. You know, <laughs> and it doesn't matter because there's no electricity. So, <laughs> you know, it's just packing all this stuff and then going somewhere out in the wilderness. Well, imagine doing that with 12 guys. Well, Jesus is on the road and he's going from town to town. And it's, it's a little like when we go camping, but uh, they probably didn't have to drag all the stuff that we have because we don't, we're accustomed to comfort. So they go. It says in Luke, uh, Luke 17, 20 to 22, now when he was asked the Pharisees, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, some versions read, or among you, speaking of the king himself. And he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it. There's a time when Jesus is going to leave and then obviously the Holy Spirit has come to be our comforter. But the kingdom of God, he says, listen, it's here and it's now because here I am. And anywhere where Jesus is, is the kingdom of God. And there are incredible things that happen when Jesus is with you, as opposed to being completely alone in your flesh, right? And it's certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, whom out of came seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's servant or steward, and Susanna and many others who provided for him from their, sub, from their substance. So Jesus didn't just travel with the 12 disciples. There were women traveling with him. 
scandalous. <laughs> Women in ministry? Yeah. <laughs> Deafening silence hit the room. It's interesting because it says they provided for him uh, from their substance. This is the word where we get the word deacon. These, these ladies were feeding and helping and providing financially for the ministry of Jesus Christ with his disciples. And they traveled with him learning. For a woman to learn in this day and age is not a problem. But back then, women didn't do that. They separated them. And it, I mean, like in Afghanistan, where, you know, they're, they're not wanting girls to get educated or go to school. It was like that. And we still have it today in other countries. But these women traveled and learned at the feet of Jesus and traveled with the disciples and also supported him out of their finances. I, I, would, would you be embarrassed to take money from a woman who wanted to support your ministry? Would your pride well up and say, ah, I don't think I need your money. I think I'm all right. I don't know. I think sometimes I feel that way. But women traveled with Jesus, and I'm sure that raised more than one eyebrow, especially Mary. Mary was very well known, and whenever you see any women mentioned in the scripture, she's mentioned first. And since she had seven demons thrust out of her by Jesus, it makes me wonder, why is it that she was mentioned first? I would think if you had somebody of that reputation among your number, you'd kind of want to hide them in the back. But the very fact that she's mentioned first and put up front tells me Jesus doesn't have a problem with this. Amen. Because every single one of us is a redeemed soul. And Jesus isn't embarrassed of us. And so I, I feel better about that. And so here are the women that followed Jesus. And you've got Mary who's, whose notoriety was, was fairly well off. And because Mary is mentioned right after this woman who came in, wept at Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. And many people think that this Mary, uh, Magdalene, is actually the Mary of the story in the previous chapter. So there's absolutely no tying in or proof. But because of that, a lot of scholars believe that this is uh, Mary Magdalene. Um, she's from Magdala. That's why she's called that. Uh, you would be called from like whatever your last name would be, be from, you know, Union, from Union Beach or wherever it is that you're from. She's from Magdala. And so she was called the Magdalene. And Joanna and Susanna, and if you look these folks up, actually, you'll notice that these women were the first to see Jesus resurrected from the dead. These were the ones that stuck close by him. And they experienced special blessings because of that. Mary, Mary was the first one who realized Jesus had risen from the dead and the first one to talk to him, the first one to worship him. And out of all of them, she's usually mentioned first. And I don't know about you, but she's got a reputation. And Jesus chose these women to reveal himself to first. I think that's extremely honoring. I see Jesus when he interacts with women being very honoring. You never see a woman get in his face and stick their finger in his face and yell and scream like some people do to me. <laughs> and it's probably because he's so much better than me. <laughs> but he always dealt tenderly and lovingly. And if he was stern, it was because it was a test to see where somebody's heart was. And it was for our benefit because it's all written down. So here's Mary and Joanna and Susanna. Was Jesus concerned how this might appear? Bunch of guys traveling with a bunch of women out on the open road. No. In fact, it, if you look over his genealogy, it's rather amazing. You'll see that he's related to Tamar, or Tamar, depending on what your accent is. She was a woman who married one of Judah's sons, and he died, and married another one of his sons, and he died. And then Judah was going to give her another son and said, ah, I don't think this is a good idea. I think I'll hold on to him for a while until he's full grown. It doesn't matter how old he is, until he's full grown. And he withheld her, and she actually played the prostitute with Judah so that she might be tied into the family. It was found out that she was pregnant, and they were going to kill her, stone her to death, except she was found with proof that it was Judah that impregnated her. 
and he was the one who actually left her off the hook. So here's a woman who did something very questionable. Sleeping with your father-in-law is kind of weird. <laughs> Getting impregnated and carrying children. And yet, because of all of that, Jesus comes out of the line with Tamar as an ancestor. I think that's amazing. Jesus is also associated to Rahab. You remember Rahab when they went up against the, the wall and... Uh, she, she smuggled the spies in and she lied, put them on the roof and said, no, they left. They took off. Maybe if you hurry, you'll catch them and lied. And she says, listen, I know about you guys. I know about your God and I know what's going on. You got to save me and my family. And they said, okay, you take this red thing out your window and anybody that's in this room will get saved. But if they're not in this room, then we're not held accountable for their lives. So if you remember that story and Jesus is related to her. It's interesting. Ruth, if you remember Ruth, actually there's an entire book which you might be familiar with called Ruth, which is you know, basically about Ruth. And Boaz, who's her husband. Boaz is this, this righteous guy and Ruth is a woman whose husband died or sons died. She ended up having come from a Gentile nation and come back and she was miserable. She said, don't call me Ruth, call me Mara because I'm miserable and Mara means bitter. I'm bitter. Just call me bitter. So she had like severe depression. Well, uh, not, not her. It was Naomi. Forgive me. Naomi comes back, says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because I'm bitter. And Ruth is the only one left over. And she's a Gentile bride to one of her sons. And she's the only one that consents to come with her and join with her and going back to the people of God. And so she does. And so she's this outcast really. And she's kind of a leftover from what once was a family. I mean, her other two daughter-in-laws were gone. They, they decided to stay with their own people. But Ruth takes this chance and goes with Naomi back. And there's a wonderful love story about everything that happened and what a complex book this is. But here, Jesus is related to Ruth, who is a Moabitess, which nobody in Israel is supposed to marry. You're not supposed to intermarry with the, you know, the Moabs, you know, from, from Moab. And yet they did. And God blessed it anyway. Jesus is also related to Bathsheba. Bathsheba, who was, you know, seen cleaning up after a, a, a week's long difficulty and seen in the naked. And David says, I want her, bring her to me. And he basically rapes her. She gets pregnant with a child. And because of that, the child dies. And then ultimately they have another child who's named Solomon who's the wisest man besides Christ that ever lived. And so Jesus is related to all of these questionable women. No wonder Jesus had an open heart towards all of the women that he spoke to. He spoke to the lowest of low, and, and whenever Mary's mentioned, she's always mentioned first. And of course, Jesus' mother, who was probably 15 or 16 years old when she was found to be pregnant with him. So and grew up basically in a single family home because you see Joseph completely disappears. It's presumed he dies, but we don't see him anywhere on the scene when Jesus is ministering. We see his brothers, we see his sisters, and we see Mary kind of at the helm. And so all of these women who were undoubtedly talked about and people looked down on, Jesus is related to them. So he's got family ties to all these folks. It makes it a, a most wonderful thing when you don't have anything to boast of in your own family line. You know, like, uh, well, we came over on the Mayflower, you see, so we're real true Americans. No, you're not. You're, everyone's imported, everybody. I mean, unless you're Native American, and they were imported from somewhere at some point. So nobody can take claim to any of that because we're all imported. So forgive the word imported. Jesus gets into his main thing. Now, the, his disciples were traveling with him. They were listening to his teaching. You, you have the women who traveled with him. They were listening to his teaching. And now he's going to speak to the crowd. He's going to speak to them in a parable. He begins in verse 4, and he says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. That means to plant. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on rock, and, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away. 
because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground and sprang up and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Apparently he was speaking in a normal tone of voice, and then he yells this verse. If Jesus is yelling at you, you should pay attention. And he says, he who has ears, let him hear. And he's not talking about anybody with the appendage. He's talking about anybody that has an understanding heart. Take note of this. So he talks about the sower who goes and sows a seed. By the way, in Jesus's time, it took about 60 pounds of seed to seed an acre. And what they would do is just indiscriminately throw the seed out. Uh, by the way, in an acre of land, there's about 3,000 pounds of weed seed that's already in the dirt. It takes 60 pounds of seed, whatever it is that you're planting, to plant an acre, but there's already 3,000 pounds of weed ready to sprout up at any moment, which is why a garden is a difficult thing. It has to be intentional. It has to be kept. It has to be monitored. It has to be fenced off. It's got to be weeded. It's got to be fed. It's got to be, all of this has to be done. But weeds? <laughs> Dandelions are everywhere in my lawn. I find them beautiful because I lack the zeal to get rid of them. <laughs> but there's, there's an average on an acre, 3,000 pounds of seed from weeds that have already been existing and blowing over your land. And so you know it's a losing battle, right? 60 pounds versus 3,000 pounds. But this is what they would do. They would just throw it out. Now we have machines now that are very, very careful with them. And it says that some of them went on a path and they were trampled down and the birds of the air came and ate them. Then there were some seeds that came and they fell on the rock, they, on rocky soil where you have rock that's just beneath the surface. You only have a little layer of dirt that sits on top, which is why the seed immediately springs up. And yet it doesn't stay that way because it dies. And then there's some that goes among thorns and the thorns grow up at the same rate and it chokes out the seed. But then there's this other seed that lands on good soil and it bears a lot of fruit. And so those of you that may not be farmers, I'm just giving you some information. So this is a parable. Not every single thing in the parable is uh, applicable. Jesus, uh, a para means beside and uh, the other half of it means to cast. So you're casting aside something. You're you're throwing a, a, a picture for somebody to understand, to kind of catch a, a teaching. It's, it's something I should do more of. But Jesus does it, and he's teaching this parable. And when he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus cried out. He, he, he didn't weep. He, he shouted. You guys like shouting pastors? Yeah, my wife doesn't like shouting pastors, so I try to be less shouty. But Jesus shouts this out. And if he's shouting it out, I think it's rather important that we take note. Why would he do that? It's like, listen up, guys. This is important. And, of course, that's, that's a beautiful elephant with the largest ears of, of most any animal that roams, except for the fox, which... Has, that's a real fox with real ears, or maybe this dog. <laughs> so these guys have ears, you know, but they may not understand what Jesus is saying. And you may have ears and yet not understand what Jesus is saying. And like Dumbo, you got to say, well, I'm all ears, you know, speak on Jesus. And so Jesus is telling this parable. Now, you know, that term doesn't mean that you're all, when you say I'm all ears, you, you like Ross Perot said one time, which he really shouldn't have. <laughs> I'm all ears is, is a euphemism. It doesn't mean that you're made of ears. It just means that you're listening. You have my attention. I'm, I'm watching. I'm waiting. In Matthew, this, just to give you the corollary passage here, Matthew 13, 
And he says, and he sowed some seed and he fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. He fell on stony places, which is a little different, and where it did not have much earth. He gives a little bit more information here in Matthew. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. So you get this plant that comes up quick because it has moisture, but it doesn't have any depth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. So we're given a little bit more information. The, the stuff on the stones doesn't thrive because it doesn't have a root. It doesn't go down into the earth and it's not able to handle, you know, uh, droughts and that kind of thing. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and it yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus, they made sure because he cried this out loudly in Luke, made sure that they got it in Matthew as well. So you've, you've got these guys giving their points of view of what Jesus said, and some are remembering a little bit more. So you got to be all ears when Jesus yells, right? And he tells you to be listening. And his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? You know, if Jesus tells you something or you read something in the Bible and you don't know what it means, it's a good idea to ask Jesus, right? You want to go to the source. You know, what? I do it all the time. What? What? Where the eagle are is the, where the eagle is, the dead bodies will be. What is that? It's, it seems completely random. What do you, it's good to ask the Lord these things. And when the disciples asked him, says, what does this parable mean? And he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, it is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Well, if you had to ask, if you had to critique the disciples, which category do you think they're in? Do you think they're the ones who have been shown the kingdom of God through this parable? Or they have no idea what he's talking about? They have no idea what he's talking about. And Jesus said, well, to you, it's been given the secret to the kingdom. <laughs> what are you talking about? But you know how it is that the kingdom was revealed to them? Because they asked him. It wasn't because they understood it naturally. It's because Jesus is about to explain it. Now he's going to break it all down, which is really awesome because it makes my job easy. <laughs> Parables are designed to reveal as well as conceal. Stories like this will apply to people that have understanding and have a spiritual mind and have ears to hear. And yet those who don't want to do what Jesus wants them to do will have no clue what's being talked about. Have you ever met people like that? You, you try to share information and they're like, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Because the Spirit of God is the one that sorts all that out and makes sense to us. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And there's no matter of yelling, screaming, jumping up and down, turning Bible pages, pointing out scriptures. None of that will help somebody whose heart is calcified. You're just not going to get through. So if you can, praise God. If you can't, I don't think it's that you did a terrible job. It's a spiritual thing. And you could just say three words and the Spirit of God can nail it home for somebody and they'll be on their knees weeping because it's a work of God. So they're designed to reveal and conceal. They had no idea what he was talking about. It's kind of like, uh, if you remember World War II, there were codes going back and forth, you know, there, you know, and we were trying to break the German code and, and all of that. It's it's coding. And I guess you can encrypt stuff too uh, on your cell phone now, but they used to do this a long time ago. And there were people that would be code breakers and they would be able to break these codes and figure out what's being said. This is another way of communicating with flags. If you were in the Navy, you'll probably recognize some of that. They actually speak to each other by flag positioning. That's, that's crazy. See, the word on top is help. So, age. You see, so you can be flipping flags all day long and I have no idea what you're saying. And it's interesting, this, the top says help 
And the bottom is the letter N, U, J, and V. And you know why that's significant? It's not. Because the Beatles album, which was called Help, you do, do, do you see how effective they are at communicating? None of them match. None of them match. Anyway, sorry. In Mark chapter 4, verse 13, it says, And he said to them, do, not, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? Jesus, speaking of this parable in specific, he says, if you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand all of them? Which tells me that this parable holds the secret to unlocking all the other parables. What's the secret? A relationship with Jesus Christ. With a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll understand the parables. Without that, you won't. Because you just don't have, you don't have the ears to hear. Verse 11, now... The parable is this. Jesus is going to break it down for them. Aren't you glad? Yes. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, but the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So Jesus says, the seed that falls on the path or by the wayside is the seed that falls on the path that gets trampled, okay? Because in, in these large areas where they plant, called fields, they have paths. They'll have, you know, stone walls between properties, and they'll typically have these paths that are designed to be walked on. You're not supposed to plant anything there because nothing grows there. And it gets walked on, it gets driven on, it gets everything else. There's no way that seed's going to last. And what happens is the birds see it, and because it's not percolated down into the rest of the growth, it's easy pickings for them, and they come. So the seed is the word of God. Jesus is clear about that. And the devil is the birds, where he comes and he steals it away from our heart. That's a little scary. Mm -hmm. So you mean I could punch my card, warm a pew, spend years in the church, and leave and not know anything? Yeah. A lot of people do that. They don't learn anything because as soon as, you, as soon as they set foot outside the door, they forget everything that happened. Yeah. It's a reality. It happens. Sometimes I do that and I'm a little worried. <laughs> it says that there are two things that happen to this word. It gets trampled by men and devoured by birds. You know, you can, you can take the word of God out and try to give it to somebody else and they won't believe it. But unless it settles into your heart and it does something in you, it's not going to mean anything to you either. So there's this trampling of it and there's also the stealing of it. Do you think this seed ever had a chance? You know, seeds are actually really cool. They have found seeds that have been in like Pharaoh's uh, sarcophagus and all they have to do is put a little moisture on them and they, they jump to life. Thousands of years old, the seeds are. But inside that seed is the potential for life. Now, it hasn't been given all the right ingredients for it to grow, but it has the potential. And everything has been written into the cellular code so that it knows exactly what to do. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And when you start looking at the complexity of human life and how it gets started with the mom and the dad and all the contributing uh, liquids, all of that which is where we get the word, anyway. I think it's absolutely amazing that, that you're going to be 50% your dad and 50% your mom, and all of that stuff is going to get sorted out, and you're going to literally get knit together in your mother's womb. And your body knows exactly when to create brain tissue and knows exactly when to make internal organs and, you know, eyes and all of that. And you're... It, all the potential is found in a little microscopic speck. And it all happened by accident. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get sarcastic sometimes. The seed that falls on the wayside gets stolen, gets stolen away. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me 
and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without Christ in your life, you can't do anything that will be of any eternal value whatsoever. Just won't be able to do it. James 1.25 says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The scripture teaches us that to prove that you have the seed of life inside of you, there needs to be action. There needs to be some growth. There's got to be some green leafy something coming off of you to show that there's life inside of you. And it's always seen by what you do and how you live. And so that's important. You know, it's like a seed, you know, you, especially if you start a garden from seeds, you know, you, you water them and you look at them and you watch them. And if you're weird, you talk to them. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You know, I made the soil nice and loose for you. I watered you every day. Then you might get discouraged and say, hey, I spent money on you. Come on. I've got all this time and attention. If I did this to an animal, he'd love me forever. What, what's going on? And it takes a little while for it to pop up. And then when it starts to pop up, it starts to grow real fast. We actually have some tomato plants that have gone absolutely wild. Um, but it's as a result of getting enough rain and enough light and, enough, and right soil and all of that. There is something that's produced in us when the Lord comes and has a relationship with us that just outflows from our lives. And if that's not happening, you should be concerned. And if the word of God is not understandable and you walk out of here and don't get it, you need to come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Okay, as long as you're agreeing. So how do you listen? And do you remember the things that you hear? I'm confident that I'm one of those soils that the, the seed has gone into and I'm producing fruit. But I have to ask myself the question, do I let people trample over me and does the word of God get lost in that? Are there ways of not remembering that are causing me to not live the life that the Lord would have me live? And I have to change the way that I live. I, I need to get back to memorizing the scriptures and pushing them in to my head and my heart so I don't sin against the Lord and so that I know it better. And I need to be that way and not be a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer of what God says. I imagine you guys probably fall into the same category. A couple of you, okay. But the ones in the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root. Who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. So this other type of soil, you notice the seed is the same in every story. They call us the parable of the seed, but it, the seed's the same. It's the soils that are different. It's the same sower. It's just the soil that's different, right? Well, this soil is just the top. It's just on the surface. It's just enough so that people think, yeah, this is a good place to put seed. This, I'm sure it'll take off here. But if you go out into Jerusalem, out in that area, they have areas like this that are just very thinly veiled with dirt on the top. And you, you dig down a little bit and it's solid rock. So it looks like, wow, this is great. You know, I... I bought myself a field real cheap. I got my 60 pounds of seed, here we go. And everything springs up immediately and you go, wow, this is, I've never seen seeds take off like this before. And it's just growing like mad. And then all of a sudden you get a couple of hot days and your whole crop is dead. You say, what the heck is this about? You dig one up and you find that it's solid rock, just a couple inches be below the surface. There are people that are like that. On the surface, they might seem as though they're interested. They might receive the word of God with joy. And that's a scary thing to think you can hear the word of God, get excited about it and receive it with joy. And yet, as soon as some difficult thing comes my way, some hardship, the sun rises and will burn up my faith because I don't have roots. Boys and girls, we need roots. We have to go down deep and you can't be, you know, if you think that coming to this church once a week is going to get you through the week, I know you're sadly disappointed, but it's not my fault. I'll do what I can, but 
during the week, that's pretty much on you. So you got to get deeply rooted. Mark 4, 17, Jesus says, and they have no root in themselves. It's a very interesting way he words it there. And so endure only for a time afterward when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So that's the sign of somebody that really hasn't received the word of God and received Christ as their savior. They're, they're like all jazzed on Sunday, but Monday morning comes and they throw the whole thing out the window. And that's scary. That's a scary thing to think about. And I have to ask myself, Lord, do I have a genuine faith? Is my root deep? Am I going to be able to handle hardship and difficulty? Because you're going to have hardship and difficulty. You just will. It's interesting because it talks about the sun coming up and scorching the plants. Isn't that what plants need? Isn't that what makes plants grow is the sun? The very sun that causes good, healthy plants to grow is the very thing that kills the plant on, on the rock because it doesn't have enough root. When you have a root in Christ Jesus and you understand the word and it's planted and affixed in your heart deeply, you'll be able to handle anything. You don't believe me, I could tell. But you will because you'll know that God, your heavenly father, has his hand upon you and he will walk through the fire with you, just like we sang. So it withers away because it has a lack of moisture and it doesn't get the moisture because the roots haven't extended. So what I need to do is grow some crazy roots. Psalm 1 verse 3 says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. He's talking about the, the, the person that does what the Lord would have them do is like a tree that's planted by water. Well, you, you can't ask for a better place to plant the tree is by, by these running waters constantly there. So my root needs to deepen. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with three things, cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So there are people who will take the word of God and they get choked by thorns and the thorns are what? cares. That would be worries, anxieties. Oh my goodness. I, I don't know how I'm going to pay that. Oh my goodness. Did you see my electric bill? Has the air conditioning been? Turn that air conditioning off. Turn that light off. Who turned that light on? <laughs> cares. Oh man, I don't get paid for another week and a half. How am I going to make that bill? What about, oh, what about this person? This person's not doing well and that person's not doing well. Oh my goodness. Do I need to wear a mask? Should I wear gloves? Should I wear an astronaut suit? Should I? <laughs> Worries, cares, you get it? And the word of God can be choked by you holding on to fears, by you not exercising faith, by you not looking to the Lord and trusting in anything else. You can't grow here. If you let the thorns grow up, you won't be able to grow. So what you got to do is you got to hack away and get a weed whacker and start trimming, right? Yep. So what are you worried about? It says if we're worried about something about in Philippians, yeah, we need to pray about everything, not worry about anything. We give it to the Lord and we let him know and he listens to us, right? Yeah. Just not, just that's good because you can't grow there. The cares, which are worries. Riches, which is money. So if you're without money, you'll have anxiety. If you have lots of money, you're going to have anxiety, but it's going to be about what you're doing with your money. Oh my goodness, I got to put it here. I got to put it there. Gotta shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Maybe this is a bad investment. I don't know. Is the real estate market going to pop? I, you know, like there's, there's all this shuffling and, and moving around because you got a lot of stuff. The more stuff you have, the more stuff you have to carry. It's just the truth. And then the pleasures of life. Yeah, I'm thinking about saving up for a helicopter. <laughs> It'd make traffic much easier to handle. Anyway, 
Of course, I'm not going to buy a helicopter. It's okay. In 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21 says this, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of the latter, meaning the wood and the clay, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. There's a, there's a good, a better, and a best that God has for our lives. And in building our lives, we tend to bring things into our lives that are, you know, some of it's good, some of it's better, some of it's best, some of it's no good at all. It's this process of choosing the better over the worse, choosing the best over the good, because best is the enemy of good. Because best means this and good means this. Stamp collecting. I guess that's good. Could you do anything better with your time? I think you could. I'm just saying. If you collect stamps, forgive me. <laughs> we have an opportunity to let things go out of our lives that aren't so good so that we can choose something better. And that's the process of sanctification, which we are in partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we get to choose those things, but if you don't hack away at those troubles and cares, if you don't hack away at the, the concern for riches and for pleasure, if you're not willing to say no to any of that stuff, I can tell you, you can't grow there. Because you'll be all obsessed with you. You're the center of the universe. It's about your pleasure. It's about what you want. It's about what troubles you have. I'm, I'm sure you've met these people, or maybe you are these people, where you're just consumed with worry or care. Can't spend two seconds without my cell phone. I gotta get out of my phone. I'm just sharing some things I struggle with. So is the world choking the word out of you? Is the world choking the word out of you? That's a question that I ask myself. Am I getting so worked up? You know, we have a men's retreat coming this weekend. It's also a baptism coming this weekend. It's also a family meal we're going to have in the evening on Sunday. It's, it's like a big week for me. I'm teaching on Thursday and going to be teaching for the whole weekend, a bunch of men, and you know how hard they can be. <laughs> and I got to get all this stuff together. I, I can get all overwhelmed with what I have to do, plus all the other things I have to do. God is the only one sufficient, and I realize that when I abide in the vine, I can do anything. But if I don't abide in the vine, I can do nothing. Amen. It's the same for you. Yes. But the ones that fell on good ground, oh, here's the good news. <laughs> All those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. You don't scream and yell at your seeds if they don't show in the first day, right? With patience. And then there's this wonderful, lush, green growth that comes in our lives. And sometimes we might not see it as that because it takes patience. But I'll bet you're not the same person you were a year ago or three years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. In fact, I'm sure you've all changed in some direction or another. The question is, are you bearing fruit to the Lord? Are you becoming more holy, which means completely given over to his purposes. And that's the, that's the check, at least in my heart, is in my bearing fruit with patience. Do you have a listening heart? That's a heart with headphones. Right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a heart with an ear on it. Are you ready to hear the word of God, even if it's difficult for you? Are you ready to hear the word of God if it means loosening up the reins of your uh, absolute control over everything in your life? Are you ready to relinquish your cares and concerns and lay them at his feet and trust him with it? Do you have a heart that hears the word of God and it goes and it begins to produce fruit? That's the important thing. And that's the whole point of what Jesus is trying to say. Do you have a listening heart? Is the seed able to penetrate your heart? Or have you worked out all these nice justifications and explanations in your mind? as to why you don't need to believe this scripture or that scripture. 
So how's your hearing? How's your spiritual hearing? Ah, you know, I can't stand going to that church another day because you know I get nothing out of it. Well, it might not be the messenger. It might be the soil of your heart. I'm convinced I could learn from a child. In fact, I did this morning. I had uh, one, of, one of their little daughters came up and gave me a big hug. I learned something. That's a really good way to greet somebody. And it takes a degree of courage. Anyway, I think we can learn from anything. So are you all ears? Are you all in? Because that's really where we need to be. Jesus takes a, a left turn here suddenly. And he says, no one, when he's lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel. Meaning a pot of some kind. Or puts it under a bed. Well, that would be a fire hazard. <laughs> but sets it on a lampstand. Well, that makes sense. That those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. hear. You see, Jesus is on the same topic. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. You see how this is tying into the same thing? It's about our listening skills with our heart. So, you light a lamp and you put it on a high place. By the way, that's Sandy Hook. If you've ever been, you'll recognize the lighthouse. And lighthouses are never short. They don't build them in a hole. They build them tall. They look, I always thought they were rocket ships when I was a kid. But they do that so that it can be seen from far away. And Jesus is saying something about a lamp. This is the twin lights, by the way, which if you've ever been up to Sandy Hook... It's uh, looking out over Sanding Hook. I don't think you'll ever see that view because they won't let you up there. But inside the tower? Inside the glass, would they? Really? Is there enough room for me? <laughs> Giant Fresnel lens up there? That's pretty cool. I know they'll let you out on the outside, but I've never been inside, uh, which you could see through the windows. But, you know, you get a really good perspective when you're up that high and you're in a place you know, the Lord has designed to put you in that place where you would be a signal to everybody around you. And if you're bearing good fruit and if you're right soil, you, everybody around you should know, oh, yeah, that's Dave, he's a Christian. Yeah, don't start a conversation with you. He'll start quoting scriptures. <laughs> People used to say that. And I was so, I was like, that's awesome. I am belligerent in a godly way. But Jesus is talking about this. We must hear and do or we will lose what we have, which is the warning he gives on the bottom. It's all about how you hear. It's about whether you're listening, whether you're going to be lit up or not. The key to having this wonderful overflowing life is to be lit up. And if the choked if, if you're getting choked by these thorns or if, if you're shallow and have no root into the word of God, if you have any of these issues or you're just forgetful and the devil steals things away from you, you're just not going to be fruitful in the way Jesus wants us to be fruitful. So I have to, I have, to have an open heart. And I don't know about you, but you, you, know, you walk with Jesus long enough, it, it's a little like learning to walk. You, know? you, you kind of need help when you're learning to walk and then you start to walk and then you learn to run and ride a bike and tap dance and you're like, hey, I don't need any help now. Well, I need you. I need you. Every hour I need you because morally uh, on our own, we would be completely a failure. And the only way to do that is to be, to be lit up is to be lit up in Christ. And Jesus takes another right turn. And then his mother and his brothers came to him uh, the other passages indicate that they thought maybe he had spoken too long or gone off a little too far. And he could not, uh, they could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. In other words, 
Rabbi, you've overstayed your welcome. You've spoken long enough to us. Please go outside. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Just when you think Jesus has taken a right turn, he brings it right back to the soils. It's the ones who hear the word of God and accept it. Those are the people that are my family. Isn't that interesting? Closer than his own mother, closer than his brothers and sisters. The ones who hear the word of God and do it. They're the good soil. That's my family. That's what he says. And I'm glad to hear that because I come from a long line of dysfunction. You've heard the thing that blood is thicker than water, right? And it's actually reverse of what most people think it means. Most people think it means your family, you have a tighter relationship with because they're your family than you do anybody else. But really the full quote is this, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. So it means opposite of what everybody usually quotes it as. In other words, you guys are my family. Amen. And you deserve the lion's share of, of, of my time and my attention. And I don't have a problem letting my family go. Pray for them, love them, care for them. But you know, I can't control them. And they may or may not come to know Christ. You may have some family that may or may not know Jesus Christ. They're going to be lost eternally if they don't know him. You guys I'm going to share eternity with. So I'd better get used to it. <laughs> the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Jesus says in John chapter 9, Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, that those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are, are we blind also? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. You see, the very fact that they chafed at Jesus saying, I've come to make the blind see and the seeing blind. He said this after he healed the blind man, by the way. And the Pharisee said, what, you calling us blind? The very fact that it bothers you tells me, yeah, you're blind. It's basically, it's the Jersey version, you guys know. <laughs> Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 3. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by our Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? What a tremendous blessing it is to hear and understand the word of God. What a terrible tragedy it is if we don't pay careful attention to it. What an incredible waste it is. It's like a seed on the side of the road that gets stolen by a bird. So Jesus says, my true family is those who hear what I say and does what I say. So recap, Jesus is spreading the news of the kingdom as Jesus goes about and he teaches and he's gathering a crowd and getting some popularity. We need to hear and to follow like others have, including a number of women who have supported him out of their own finances and taken care of him. We have this wonderful benefit to be able to further the kingdom of God by doing that. We know that the sower goes out and throws seed. We know that it sets upon hard places that get walked on by men and places where the, the birds of the air, the devil himself comes and steals these things away. We need to strive so that that doesn't happen. Be careful that you don't lose what's been given to you. I want to make sure that I have deep roots into the word of God so that when the seed of the word of God comes and lands upon my heart, it develops fruit and the root 
deepens me. I want to make sure that I'm doing regular landscaping around my life so that the pleasures of this world, the riches and the cares of my own heart don't choke the word of God and make me some faithless automaton going through the motions. I want to be one of those 30, 60, 100 fold fields for the Lord where the word of God goes into me and it produces fruit and it benefits everyone. And I imagine you're the same way. I want to be what Jesus calls me, the light of the world. I want to be able to shine from a high place. And I don't want to be shy about it. I don't want to be belligerent, but I do want to be bold. And I think that's what Jesus is calling to. And it's about hearing the word and saying something to people about it. Because if it doesn't come out of your mouth, then how can it be in you? And if you won't care to love somebody, to tell them that they're in danger, then it's like letting somebody go off a cliff. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Those of us who know and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ are family. And God is our father. And we have this tremendous benefit to be a family. A family that's probably stronger than even your own family at home. And that's the way it should be. Amen. Jesus said so. And we need to be all ears. Whatever it is that the Lord wants to say to us, however he wants to say it to us, even if it hurts, even if it's difficult to hear, we should be willing because he is the son of God. He is the one who purchased our very lives and he deserves our full attention. Amen. So that's the sower, the seed, and the soil. Pray that you guys would deepen in your knowledge of the word that you would be instant to respond as God has touched your heart. And in this time, as the worship team comes up, I want you to think about the things that maybe you heard here today from God's word that made an impression on you. Because you have an opportunity to get that stuff off of the, the track and put it in some good soil. We have an opportunity to do that. Pray that you would consecrate that to him.